Education. I'm your host, Anika Daniels Osaze, and I'd like to welcome all of you here today. Thank you so much to our studio audience and our viewers at home. Today's topic is a very serious issue, an uh, issue that's very devastating to not just the students and the faculty, but administrators at Cornell University. An issue yet again where we have people of color being marginalized. In the process of the senior administration at Cornell, doing what they call reimagining Cornell University. They have forgotten to include the people who actually work for the university and study at the university and even pay for the university to operate in the process of making these changes. So today I have invited four distinguished faculty from the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell to talk about some of those issues that are occurring as we speak. On my right, we have Dr. Robert Harris, the current director of, Af of the Africana Center and the former vice provost for diversity and faculty development. Next to him, we have Mwalimu Abdul Nanji, who is the coordinator of the African Languages Program at the Africana Studies Center and also a professor of Kiswahili. Next to Mwalimu Nanji, we have Dr. James Turner, the founder of the Africana Center and professor of African American Studies. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Undri Asi Lumumba, the Director of Graduate Studies and Professor of African and African Diasporic Education and Gender Studies. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here on such short notice. But this is such an important topic. Thank you. And I'm glad that you're actually able to be here, because I want as many people to know as possible what's going on and how it's affecting all of us. Um, including alumni of Cornell University. So what I'd like to do is start off um, by having Dr. Turner talk a little bit about the history of the Africana Center. Why does it exist? What was happening during the time that it was developed? And why is it so important that we still have it now? Well, the Africana Studies and Research Center was developed in 1968-1969. It uh, formally uh, opened at the university that is offering its first complement of classes in the fall of 1969. Mm -hmm. And what took place at Cornell in very many ways mirrored what was happening in the country broadly. We have to think about the period of 1950, 1955, if you will, to 1970 as a major a period in which black people pushed uh, the issue of democratic rights, of uh, the end of segregation, uh, the ability of black people to express their interest and, and their own voice. And large part of this movement was conducted uh, by students, by young people. Uh, we all remember the young students from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality, and other organizations that uh, took off from school, many of them, left the things they were doing, and went uh, south especially to confront American apartheid, or what's called, a, we call here American segregation. But there also was a northern aspect of this movement. It was, a, it was a national student movement. And students outside of the South were highly inspired by what they saw other young black people doing. Mm -hmm. And they took up the issue of constructing an education that would be both relevant and meaningful to them and would tell our story and would tell our truths. And in that sense, they saw themselves as being the guardians of a people's history, culture, and condition. And uh, it was that motive that led to the demand for what was then generally called black studies or African American studies. Now, this is not the first time that these ideas had been expressed in African American history. But it was, of course, uh, the first time that it was presented in such a major way at historically white institutions. And I think it's important for the audience to understand, while we talk a good deal about historically black 
universities and colleges. The flip side of that is that there were historically white colleges and universities, and these schools were mostly exclusive of black people. And not only did they not have black students in any significant measure on campus, they didn't have a curriculum that reflected the history and culture and conditions of black people. It was not inclusive of the full story of, the, of American society, but of the world for that matter. As our mentor, John, the late Professor John Henry Clark used to say, if you have missing pages from a book, then you don't have a complete book of the history of the world or of any particular society. So that was, in a nutshell, the, um, the motive. And as I say, it was largely engineered by young people and, in some instances, younger faculty who were on campus, particularly at places like Howard University and San Francisco State University and even uh, places like Northwestern and Columbia University. Uh, and um, so that this student movement produced on this campus is the demand for African American and African studies. Now, last point I'd like to make, they were also very concerned to reconstruct the way in which these historically white universities and colleges were treating Africa and its diaspora. Africans and African Americans, Africans in the Caribbean, and in uh, the so-called South America. They had pretty much separated them, delinked them, delinked African studies from African American studies as if they had no connection. This idea that black people in the so-called New World, in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. in America, had no history, mm -hmm. had no background. These young people made it very clear that they wanted this artificial marginalization mm -hmm. of black people, one from the other, to stop, mm -hmm. and therefore argued for the reconstruction of the notion of African studies, which would include Africa, mm -hmm and the descendants of Africa, mm -hmm. therefore the concept Africana Studies and Research Center. Now the initial uh, building wasn't welcomed on campus. Mm -hmm. From what I remember, it was actually burned. Well, there was of course a, a great deal of tension and pressure uh, on black students who, who were in 1969 on campus. They were not in great numbers, they were less than 200. Uh, uh, at the time. But of course this idea that American education, that American academy, mm -hmm. that American colleges and universities ought to in fact teach the full measure of the history and truth of, uh, of, of this country and the people in it. And especially in this case we were arguing for black people mm -hmm who had made in this country in, in great measure, along with the other people who had been oppressed, the Native Americans or the American Indians, mm -hmm. all who were treated as if they were insignificant. So that um, there, was, there was pressure and there was opposition. Mm -hmm. The faculties did not think that this was worthy. It, of course, was areas of study that they didn't know themselves. So, um, yes, the first building that was on, uh, located at what was then called 320 Wade Avenue, within eight, nine, or 10 months of its, its, uh, its starting, as a matter of fact, in the 1st of April of 1970, it was set ablaze by arsonists and burned to the ground. Which even gives more reason why we needed to have this kind of center because you still had the ignorance out there where people didn't mm. want us to exist, mm. didn't understand our purpose, and didn't understand why we thought it was so important to teach this history. So well, of course, mm -hmm. yes. And it was, 
It was a place of education in the full sense. It dealt with the whole student, the student in the classroom mm -hmm. and also the student outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. It also was a place in which faculty and students were in close quarter mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. that students became familiar with the faculty from Africana. They were able to see them, drop in and talk with them. And likewise, we, of course, knew all of the students who were there mm -hmm. and interacted freely. It was a community space. It was a space that students came from around the campus, mm -hmm. whether they were taking classes or not, or whether they were in different colleges, because we were very careful to make sure that the Africana Studies a researcher was a freestanding, independent academic unit that mm -hmm. could relate to students from all of the colleges. We were not bound to one college. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, a very important aspect. It also allowed us to make relationships with other colleges, with other universities around the country, as well as those in our region who had and were also developing the, uh, programs uh, of African and African American studies. See, that's a great lead-in because you have this great institution that's doing scholarly research, you have world-renowned faculty that are there, mm. you've had thousands of alumni that are gra graduated and done very mm. well mm. and are um, contributing greatly to society. But now there's some controversy about whether the Africana Center should stay autonomous. So, um, Dr. Harris, from my understanding, the senior administration wants to change the structure of Africana by merging it into the College of Arts and Sciences. And the way this decision was made was very abrupt and with little to no consultation with the parties involved. And although the physical center will remain, the center will lose its autonomy and end up being uh, swallowed up by a larger college. Can you explain the events that led to this? Well, I'm not sure I fully understand the events <laughs> or that we understand the events that uh, led to this. Uh, this is a decision that was made by the uh, provost. It's a decision that was not discussed with the faculty uh, of the Africana Center. Uh, I was appointed as director of the Africana Center uh, effective July 1, 2010. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I was appointed uh, as director, there was no conversation, no discussion about moving the Africana Center into the College of uh, Arts and Sciences. Uh, this is a decision the provost has made. For what reason? We're still not uh, fully clear on. Mm -hmm. uh, we function going on 42 years now, reporting directly to the provost. Mm -hmm. uh, our administrative structure is one that uh, many institutions around the country uh, admire, would like to emulate. Mm -hmm. uh, they, in fact, are encouraging us uh, to resist this move because many of them would like to become like we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been in the forefront, as uh, Professor Turner mentioned. Uh, we started out combining Africa, African America, the Caribbean, uh, moving more into the uh, diaspora, using the term Africana, which a number of programs and departments are now beginning to pick up. Mm -hmm. They're programs that are trying to move more toward us and mm -hmm. yet the administration at Cornell wants to move us back more toward these uh, groups that want to be like us. Mm -hmm. So what happened here, I just fully, I mean, I, I, I can't fathom, I, I, I don't fully uh, understand it. The provost has said basically that he can't administer the Africana Center. Well, when he mentioned this to me, I said, that's the reason why you have a director mm -hmm. uh, of the Africana Center. If you can't administer it, let your director administer it. And uh, to me, in, 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 in some respects, it suggests that uh, he doesn't have confidence in his director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you know, the alum I have to say, as an alum, I felt duped when I first received an email from Cornell saying, great news 
you know, the Africana Center is getting a new PhD program, and it will be moved into the College of Arts and Sciences. And they made it seem like it was a nice, neat package that in order for you to get the PhD program, you had to be moved into the College of Arts and Sciences. Now, I remember um, even as a student, there was a process where you were already working on a PhD program, and even more recently, as an alum and keeping in touch, there were already uh, p things in place for that PhD program to exist. So it seems like it was an excuse for a university to be able to say this is why it needs to happen, but to my understanding it didn't need to work that way. Is that correct? Well, we've been working on developing a PhD degree program. There were some things that we needed to put in place uh, to work toward uh, this doctoral uh, degree. Uh, we have a draft for a PhD degree program. Mm -hmm. At the time that we were working on that, uh, we were working under the assumption that we basically had to work through the graduate school as opposed to working through the College of Arts and Sciences or any college for mm -hmm. that matter because we report directly to the provost and it was our assumption that uh, we would be able to develop the PhD degree program working through uh, with the provost and the uh, graduate school. So um, there was a particular spin put on this decision and announcement in indicating that the Africana Center was going to get more resources mm -hmm. and that it was going to get a PhD degree program. Mm -hmm. Well, we're yet to know what those resources are. Okay. Is now, it going to be $10 mm -hmm. more than our current budget? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be much more than that? We don't know mm -hmm. what it is. So you've mentioned one major issue, which is your budget structure will, mm -hmm. will change. What other things would change if the Africana Center, in fact, ended up in the College of Arts and Sciences? Well, we as, and again, this is one of the things that has made us unique. It has made us different yeah. from a number of institutions in that we have been able to within, of course, the procedures of the university as a whole, but we've been able to select our faculty. We've been able to appoint our faculty. We've been able to recommend our faculty for promotion and tenure. Going into the College of Arts and Sciences is going to limit us in those uh, functions that we uh, were able to carry out in the past. Okay. Professor Nanji, um, can you talk to us a little bit about what the reaction has been on campus um, from students, from administrators and other faculty? Um, I know, for example, this happened during a major exam week for students, and I'm sure that they were coming to many of you as faculty saying, you know, I'm very stressed, I don't know why this is happening right now. What were some of the reactions? Um, it happened just before the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And I think it was done strategically, thinking that by doing it at that particular time, uh, students will not be interested. They'll be more so concentrating on their finals and that the issue will just will not be addressed. However, when students heard about it, um, some students didn't understand what was really going on in the sense that the spin was looking so good Mm -hmm. in the sense of we're going to get more resources and we're going to be uh, having our PhD program. So it seemed like a nice package. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even as alum, we were thinking, wow, we're going to go, you know, Jabari and I wanted to apply to the PhD program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, who wouldn't when you see a package like that? Uh, but then uh, after we started informing the students, when they, and they began to understand that this decision was made, first of all, without us even being part of it. Mm -hmm. We didn't even have a discussion about it. It was just thrown at us mm -hmm. with no consultation from anybody. Mm -hmm. And from our point, the provost actually doesn't even know this field. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know the Africana field at all. And so we explained the situation to the students and they began to do more research about it. And from that point, they began to organize. They organized to seek some more information from us, from the faculty, from us to find out what the whole story is and what would happen 
in terms of when if the Africana studies move to the arts and sciences and how it would impact them. Mm -hmm. And of course the students then demanded to meet the provost and have a meeting with him so there was a um, a, um, a meeting b between the students and the provost where the provost had to explain with the president of the university why this move was being done. Mm -hmm. So, so far the students have challenged the whole idea of moving the Africana to the arts and sciences. They want this decision to be, as of now, rescinded and if there are any discussion, there should be discussions between the faculty and the um, uh, administration and included in that students want to be part of this discussion also mm -hmm. because they were also excluded totally. They didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And mind you that the birth of Africana itself mm -hmm. was student-centered mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and they had an input into this mm -hmm. and now they were also excluded from this. Mm -hmm. So it has now, uh, it, the situation has now been so the students have been very much involved and very much in organized. They have um, issued a petition out uh, for mm -hmm. uh, nationwide for people to respond to it and for alumni yeah. to respond. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of movement in terms of student participation and in organizing to see this situation is uh, stopped mm -hmm. and for the center to be as it is and the relationship of Cornell and the Africana Center should stay as it has been. Now, has the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences have said anything to you at all about what's going on, and was he aware of this process before it's, 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 it was it's, announced? It's our understanding that he had been consulted before this uh, announcement was made, mm -hmm. and that he was uh, asked not to say anything about it. There were other members of the administration who uh, were informed. Uh, I was told before the provost came over to make his announcement uh, to the faculty that he was going to uh, make, as I understood it, a, a recommendation, uh, but he didn't want me to discuss it with the faculty and I said, okay, uh, I think your audience needs to be aware that on December 1st, as uh, Namji, Namji was talking, <laughs> about the students. On December the 1st, the provost came to our faculty meeting, made an announcement. Mm -hmm. I thought, and I believe that other members of the faculty thought that he was going to come and he was going to have a conversation, he was going to have a discussion with us. He made an announcement and that was it. And he had asked to meet with the students at 4.30 that day before he met with the students, an hour before he met with the students, a public announcement had gone out, probably the announcement you got as a member of SEBA. This was before he spoke with students, had an opportunity to hear anything from them. Mm -hmm. And SEBA being the Cornell Black Alumni Association. Yes. Okay. Okay, Dr. Lumumba, um, to my understanding, this is not an isolated incident. This isn't the first thing that's happened um, recently on Cornell's campus where students haven't had a voice, faculty and administrators haven't had a voice, at least of color. Can you talk a little bit about other issues that are happening? And also, um, can you elaborate on the letter that was actually uh, written by the black, I believe it's the Black Professional Women's Forum at Cornell? Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, um, this is not isolated. There have been many events in recent years that have been of concern. This organization, Black uh, Professional Women's Forum, is a group of uh, women on campus who care about uh, a number of issues, issues of re uh, recruitment, issues of retention, because there was a sense that even when recruitment happens, retention was still a problem. So this uh, revolving door, anytime you come, you find a number of black people. Mm -hmm. But when you come another time, it's a different group of people. So retention was a problem. And the whole climate on campus had been one of our concern. So although it is an organization of, of black women, our concerns are campus-wide and the entire community, mm -hmm. uh, faculty, staff, students. So the issues, many of the issues that have come to our attention in the past few years that we have expressed concern about uh, include the declining recruitment of black students. 
as uh, it was reported actually in the student uh, newspaper on campus, the Cornell Daily Sun, of um, September uh, 3rd, uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a fact. We have the statistics. 20% uh, decrease. That's significant. Mm -hmm. And then there is a major program that was very popular that uh, uh, contributed to attract a student, to make them aware that uh, the campus would uh, make some effort, at least to welcome them. And it was called uh, Diversity Hosting Weekend, mm -hmm. and it was eliminated. Mm -hmm. Eliminated. Mm -hmm. So its elimination removed uh, a major opportunity to recruit potential undergraduate uh, and uh, graduate too, minority student across campus. Mm -hmm. So that's significant. And then uh, there was an announcement right in the uh, fall semester of the departure of the associate dean of the graduate school in charge of uh, minority recruitment. Mm -hmm. That was an imagine, uh, another major uh, announcement that was a shock to everybody. Um, and that left a big hole mm -hmm. in the whole uh, uh, graduate school. Uh, uh, issues of importance to not only black students, but other minority students as, as well, as they refer to them. And then uh, there is another issue uh, that, um, well, from what is happening now is supposed to be resolved, mm -hmm. uh, it was the unknown future of the position of the Office of Minority Educational Affairs. Mm -hmm. Since let, this letter was written on December 14th, 2010, there have been recently some um, um, processes mm -hmm. to hire, but still there is considerable reason to be concerned mm -hmm. about the whole position, mm -hmm. how it is going to be redefined. So there are issues that still are very much relevant regarding that particular position. And it's the physical location is actually supposed to be moved from the yes, center of indeed. campus yeah. further out towards what's considered North Campus. Yes, right. Almost invisible to the yeah. rest of the campus if you don't live yeah. somewhere in North, correct? And well, now this new position for the Office of Minority Educational Affairs, I believe the new title is supposed to be Associate Vice Provost for Assistant, Assistant, Vice, Assistant Provost. Vice Provost. A little for, bit of a difference. Um, so. Yes, and, uh, and the position, from the what we understand, is being split uh, into two. So mm -hmm. there are some issues, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. that are unclear uh, to us now. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, merging all of what they consider diversity issues into one location, my understanding is. It's no longer just minority student affairs, mm -hmm. for lack mm -hmm. of a better term, but issues that affect all areas of diversity. So it's almost like splitting hairs and splitting budgets and you know, almost diluting the needs for minority students. Well, yeah, these are some of the issues. Mm -hmm. And um, two other major concerns that were reflected in the letter mm -hmm. that was written in December is uh, back in 2009, mm -hmm. summer 2009, suddenly the very popular resident hall director of Ujima was removed. Well, there was a decision, similar mm -hmm. to the decision about Africana, to remove him from uh, Ujima to another okay. uh, residential hall. And Ujima With Residential the, College focuses yes, on right. the African diaspora. Indeed. It's a residence hall where people can study. Yes, that, indeed. So for people who aren't familiar. It, it is a program house. OK. Well, it, it, it means if you have an interest in understanding uh, Africa and African people mm -hmm. in the continent and the diaspora, mm -hmm. there have been issue, issues. There have been different programs. When I came to Cornell 20 years ago as a visiting professor, uh, Fulbright Fellow, I was invited to give some talk about contemporary African issues. Mm -hmm. And many other people were invited. There are a variety of programs that the uh, Ujama provides that supplement their education in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And it is not limited 
to the uh, African student or people of African descent, as Professor Turner was saying, mm -hmm. the big hole in the whole education and curriculum at Cornell was not something that was missing only for people of African descent. Mm -hmm. It's the entire population. There mm -hmm. are many people who do not live in Ujama who go there, mm -hmm. who look forward to participating in many programs. Mm -hmm. So all that was completely ignored, and the residence hall director was suddenly called, and uh, he was told that he was going to be moved. After over out. two decades. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. without any recognition. And then, uh, Eventually, they left him for one year under the pressure, concern of uh, alumni, the faculty. We spent the whole summer mm -hmm. dealing with this issue. Mm -hmm. But they left him for one year and eventually removed him from Ujima. Mm -hmm. And the last issue, there were many. In writing this letter, and I'm a member of this uh, organization, we decided to focus and at the same time raise other important critical issues. So there are many others. Mm -hmm. The climate, the whole climate issue. But the one of the final uh, point that we made in this letter, which was co-signed by two of our senior members, uh, Professor Margaret Washington, who is a professor of um, African American history in the history department, and Professor Josephine Allen, who was literally forced to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, she was offered a position at uh, Binghamton University. When she talked to the, uh, her department, they didn't make any counter offer. Mm. But what is special is that Professor Allen was the first black woman to be tenured by Cornell. Mm. Wouldn't you treasure such a person? Mm -hmm. But the way she was treated in the process was simply unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So it was not just Professor Allen. There were many other women, as it is uh, clearly articulated in the letter. Since uh, 2007, retention of black professional, uh, professionals, so not just uh, women, professionals across uh, the campus that had declined. And during this period alone, Cornell lost at least eight African-American women, mm -hmm. eight, out of a small number to start with. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the contextual issues. So it's not Africana. Africana is coming as one of the critical points that we need to focus on, but we cannot fully understand it unless we put it in the broader context. So these are some of the contextual issues. Thank you so much for that. I might add something. Um, many of our colleagues uh, around the country, and we're hearing from individuals uh, all over the country. In fact, some people outside of the country uh, have contacted us. And one of the things that they refer to is that the way in which the Africana Studies and Research Center was established at Cornell University with the director combining an academic program all with a, a research mission um, they saw Cornell as valuing Africana studies. And now they see Cornell with this proposed move. And we see it as a proposed move because we, of course, are resisting it. Mm -hmm. They see Cornell as now devaluing mm -hmm. Africana studies. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So why now? Why have all of these issues come to a head all of a sudden. I mean, as a student, there were always issues. I mean, I, I don't want to give the illusion that, you know, Cornell was a perfect place. I mean, I loved my experience there, and so did many of my friends and colleagues. But now it seems that all the things that they were fighting to do when I was there, they decided to just do it now <laughs> that we're gone, all at one time, in a devastating manner. What, what's going on? Well, I think it's important to recognize the point you made. What made your experience what it was at Cornell mm -hmm. was that we had these institutions, mm -hmm. the Office of Minority Educational Affairs slash COSEP. Mm -hmm. We had COSEP advisors in each of the colleges. Mm -hmm. We had the summer, pre summer program for people coming in to introduce them. We had Minority Hosting Weekend. We had Ujima as a vibrant, you know, active place for students, for intellectual as well as social life. 
and uh, we had Wari House. Mm -hmm. These, uh, and then we had our sister institutions like the Latino Living Center, which is a living and learning center, the American Indian Program. You see, and then the budding development of the Asian American Studies program as well. These provided a sense that Cornell was a very special place, mm -hmm. that it cared about this constituents, it cared about black students, it was concerned about um, Latino and other students as well. And it had one of the most forward looking progressive, institutionalized development of Africana studies anywhere. Mm -hmm. Everyone said, if you can have Africana studies developed like they are at Cornell, then it's possible for us. Mm -hmm. But more than that, the fact that Cornell's had this Africana Center was a beacon, was an inspiration that it treated it in a serious manner. Its role was institutionalized and legitimate, and everyone felt it was there, you know, for the future. For, for the future. Mm -hmm. This made a real difference. Mm -hmm. Now, and so, and so you had these elders, these black educators, administrators on campus that you knew were there who were looking after the interest of young people like yourself coming. Who did the recruiting to see that you got to Cornell? Who was the people, who, were, who did the negotiation with the financial aid and admissions office to see the kind of packages were given so that people could afford to be there? Mm -hmm. This was the role of black educators and administrators. They had a voice. They could contend with white administrators who were making errors or were being culturally illiterate and being insensitive or, and what have you. And so I think this is so important for, for your audience to understand, for our alums to understand. They say, oh, well, things were nice. Yeah, because of the way they were. Now you see. Uh, these reversals. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought that I could have imagined we'd see the kinds of things taking place at Cornell mm -hmm. now. But to your question, why? Well, if we all knew, we'd of course know how to have anticipated <laughs> it. But it's not much different than you're seeing in other places in the society. There has always been a pushback, a, a uh, backlash, as you, as you will, against the progressive development for African people in America and others. Mm -hmm. And now we see some of that coming to fruition in this era of the rise of the right, of this fundamentalist groups, of these groups who are anti-equality, -e who talk about constitutional originalism and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we should not un think that it is not present in the behavior at Cornell. The also using the fiscal crisis, the fiscal problem, as a, as a pretext also now to reshape the amount of resources that will be available I think is, is also, always also important. Fiscal crises in, in, the, in America have always been resolved on the backs of black people mm -hmm. and poor people. Mm -hmm. It's always those who get shoved out the door, who get uh, neglected or have their resources withdrawn and, and redone. And then lastly, there is the view that Black people should not have institutional bases, hmm. shouldn't have a niche in the institution from which they can have a platform to express their, their, their point of view 
and have some leverage in the, in, in the university. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we see what's happening coming from two rather conservative white men is not accidental. Mm -hmm. may, may I just add, uh, sure. add here that Cornell is um, an Ivy League, <laughs> but also it has uh, that other side, the public side. Mm -hmm. And station. one argument they had advanced is that uh, the Africana studies, the structure of the Africana studies mm -hmm. is unusual, mm -hmm. as if being unique means necessarily negative. Mm -hmm. And yet Cornell itself has a very unique situation of having a, a public side, an endowed side, and a public side. Mm -hmm. So this is the inconsistency yeah. uh, in, in terms of the judgment and assessment. But the other thing I would like to add is Cornell is also supposed to be a land-grant institution, mm -hmm. caring for service to the community. And this has been one of an, uh, the important uh, aspect of the Africana studies. Mm -hmm. To uh, quote here uh, uh, the uh, African-American scholar, Sheila uh, Walker, we don't have, uh, treat our people where we do our research as data plantation. Mm -hmm. Where you go, you harvest your data, you go, you write your books with fancy titles and pictures on the cover and forget it. We are involved in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a dimension, a sense that we have a duty to contribute, to participate, to create linkages mm -hmm. that enrich us and that also contribute to the community. And so this dimension is not understood or appreciated mm -hmm. in an institution that is supposed to be a land-grant uh, 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 mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. Because one of the um, subtexts in moving us to art and sciences is as if we go there, we're going to do rigorous mm -hmm. scholarship mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, another, and yet we do the rigorous scholarship in the Africana studies. Mm -hmm. We understand, although we don't use our people just to study them and live uh, as if we don't have anything to do with the community. So this, these are some of the critical points. And in addition, we, with very few exceptions, such as uh, Mwali Munanji, we all came from the um, so-called traditional disciplines, sociology, history, education. Mm -hmm. So we all graduated from the same institutions, same programs that people in the art and sciences graduated from. Mm -hmm. So why in the world they would be more qualified to help us establish a PhD program? It's very interesting when they put up the fiscal argument, and this is what they have couched this whole issue, that uh, the provost office want to divest all the other responsibilities they have uh, because they want to save money in that office. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if that's the question, you're talking about saving money, and at the same time, you're, in your spin, you're saying that we're going to be put into the arts and sciences college, and then you're going to find us money. So where are you going to find this money that you don't have? Mm -hmm. You want to divest on one side, and then you're going to tell us that you're going to give us more money, mm -hmm. and you're saying you don't have money. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it doesn't flow. The argument does not flow at all. So that's why this whole thing is there's intention. As Professor Turner has said, there's this element that is running. Mm -hmm. And we are now feeling it in the sense that uh, as African peoples, mm -hmm. that we have to be put a stop to us at a certain point. Yes, yeah. very good point. Uh, we have a special guest with us that has uh, we've asked to actually call in. Dr. Alexander, are you there? I am. Okay, great. We have Dr. Leslie Alexander, who was a graduate student at Cornell University and earned her doctorate in history as well as uh, earned a minor in Africana Studies through the Africana Center. She's also a board member of the National Council for Black Studies. So I want to welcome her to the show and I also wanted to have you talk a little bit about what the reaction has been from the National Council for Black Studies and also if you can touch upon the petition. I know you helped create the petition that Mwali Munanji mentioned a little bit earlier. Sure, well first thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, share a few thoughts on your show. Um, 
the, the response from the National Council for Black Studies has been overwhelmingly in support of the faculty members at the Africana Studies and Research Center, as well as um, supporting them in their fight to, rem to retain their current status. Um, there was a letter drafted by um, the president of the National Council for uh, Black Studies and um, received support from the board members as well. Mm -hmm. I'll just say really quickly a, a few of the, the main points that, um, that the members of, of NCBS were, were most concerned about. Um, the first has to do with the process by which this particular um, event and decision uh, unfolded. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that the, that the members of your um, panel have been tremendously um, modest and um, tremendously dignified in terms of their response to this because the reality is that the way in which this decision was made and unveiled was unbelievably disrespectful um, towards faculty members who have literally dedicated their entire careers, decades of their lives to building and sustaining and breathing life into the Africana Center at Cornell University. And one of the points that we were really trying to highlight in, in the letter that NCBS um, wrote to the president and the provost was just a very sort of fundamental point about the issue of faculty governance. The, the very idea that the provost or a president would make this kind of unilateral decision without any significant faculty consultation or discussion is, is just absolutely, it, it's really unimaginable. Um, in this kind of a university structure. And again, the fact that, that, that the provost would, would make this kind of decision in, in a complete violation of, of normal rules of faculty governance, I think demonstrates a, just a profound disrespect for the center and, and for its, its faculty. So that was really one of the, the profound concerns that NCBS had was, was just the sort of disrespect of, of the process of normal faculty governance. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue, and, and I can talk in more detail about, about some of these if you like, but just very quickly, I think one of the other issues that, that NCBS is very concerned about actually spoke to a point that um, a couple of the professors already made, and that, that deals with the way in which Africana Studies at Cornell has really served as a model mm -hmm. for other Africana Studies programs, departments, uh, institutes, whatever form they may take on other uh, campuses. The Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell has really served as a model towards which other departments and institutes and centers around the country have, have essentially been striving towards um, because, of its, because of its sort of structure, um, its relationship and existence within the institution. Mm -hmm. they, they really have represented the sort of um, epitome of, of what other, other black studies and Africana studies programs around the country have, have sought to create for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, the decision that Cornell has made in relation to the Africana Studies Center at, at, at Cornell sends a really ominous message um, to the rest of the Africana or Black Studies community across the nation, uh, sends the message that, that we are all going to end up in a, a situation where we are sort of at the mercy of the mm -hmm. university and are going to be stuck in these um, colleges or stuck in these structural arrangements that don't really serve the best interest of Africana studies as a discipline. Mm -hmm. And to, to, just to very quickly give you a, a specific example of, of what I mean by that, I think that potentially one of the most troubling aspects beyond the financial issues that, that a number of people were already addressing, I think one of the real concerns about Africana's move to College of Arts and Sciences is the fact that the provost has made it very clear that he envisions future faculty hires 
in the Africana Center to be directly connected to faculty hires in other departments in the college. And what that would therefore mean is that future hiring of mm -hmm. faculty members, as well as future promotion and tenure cases mm -hmm. of faculty members in Africana would all be to some degree dependent on or at the mercy of other traditional disciplines um, within the college. And I, there are very few other academic disciplines that are at the mercy of other departments to mm -hmm. determine the legitimacy of their academic discipline in the way Africana would be. And it's interesting because they, it's already clear that they're not, they don't understand Africana studies as a discipline, but in addition, there aren't that many faculty of color in those specializations such as history and sociology and psychology. I mean, we're not even present in those areas. Right, I think that's right. And I actually also think that um, this is Cornell's okay. attempt to sort of try to divert attention away from the fact that attempts to try to diversify the traditional disciplines in the College of Arts and Sciences have been embarrassingly unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. um, and so by placing the Africana Center within the college and using Africana and joint appointments with Africana as a way to um, diversify the faculty in the entire College of Arts and Sciences is a way of really removing the responsibility from traditional disciplines to diversify their own department. Mm -hmm. So now, where are we with the position that you helped to create? How many people are there and how, if people are interested in signing up, where do they go? Okay, so we would really like to strongly encourage people to support us by signing the petition. And there is an online petition. It can be found at www.ipetitions.com slash petition slash save Africana. Okay. And I can repeat that again in just a moment. But um, when, you, when you arrive at that website, all you have to do is um, fill out a little bit of information at the bottom and, um, and hit sign petition, and you will be doing a, a tremendous service. At this point, we have actually close to 1,500 signatures mm. um, of folks from all around the country, alumni, distinguished um, members of the Africana Studies and Research field, um, just basically friends and supporters, Cornell alumni, um, who have come together across the country to express their, their outrage over um, the provost announcement. And just very quickly, again, for people who are interested in signing, they can find the website at www.ipetitions.com slash petition slash save Africana. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. I'm glad you were able to be here with us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. Okay, so now my question to you is, where do we go from here? What, just so we're all clear and we're all on the same page, what do you want and how do you want us to help you get it? Well, we want the uh, provost to rescind his decision and we believe we're not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. We believe that there should have been a conversation before he made his announcement. Mm -hmm. And we think that we should, he should have that conversation. He should rescind his decision. He should have that conversation with us. Mm -hmm. And we, we mean a conversation, mm -hmm. a give and take, back and forth. Mm -hmm. not unilateral announcement. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, we do have some friends and alumni with us. Are there any questions that, uh, or comments? We have enough time for one or two. Great. If you can introduce yourself and say what college you're from. Um, I'm... Uh, and what year you graduated. Jonel Daphnis, uh, class of 98, mm -hmm. uh, School of Agriculture Life Science. Okay. Uh, we're all grateful that you're here to, to uh, give us a uh, critical analysis and proper context to this. This is something that uh, many of the uh, alum, uh, we aren't fortunate enough to be on campus to learn about this, so we're grateful that the show uh, is taking place. Um, to follow up 
this uh, Dr. Leslie Alexander, uh, there's a petition that uh, we all will visit and, and sign. What can we do as alum? Uh, f uh, we're off campus. We're learning about this from a distance. But we are there with you in heart. We want to know what we can do uh, to support Africana, to support uh, students of color on the campus, um, and to, uh, to support our legacy on the campus. I think, uh, Janelle, thank you for that. It's very important for you and others to contact your circle of alums, inform them, and first and foremost, as quickly as possible, I mean, even after you go out from this studio to contact people, have them sign the petition. Also, we want to organize letter writing campaigns. You should sign the petition, then each person should sit down, take a half hour, 40 minutes, and write a letter showing your ex ex extreme concern to the president of the university, to the provost, and to the, the chairman of the, the board of trustees. We must have a deluge of letters coming in. And then those of you who can manage, we'd appreciate a small contribution to help us ca keep carrying this fight on. We have to use resources that are independent, obviously. Uh, so that if we could get all those who signed the petition to send $10, we'd be able to carry on uh, the, the work that we have to do in producing, reproducing the petition to uh, newspaper advertisements and, and the like. That's so important. But also start this contact between yourself and your community of alums. Mm -hmm. We have an account, uh, Save ASRC, and if checks are made out to Save ASRC, they can be sent to the Africana Studies Research Center at Cornell. I, I would like to add, <clears throat> we have a, a major challenge that we need to address to um, make the administration realize that there was a major mistake made mm -hmm. and we have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So we need all the support, mm -hmm. but we need to look beyond. How come the Africana studies, with all the work that has been done in 42 years now, there's no endowed chairs in the Africana. Mm -hmm. We work as hard, mm -hmm. we produce, mm -hmm. we, we, we excel. Well, our African culture uh, make us be humble, but in the culture where we're operating, mm -hmm. you need to uh, show how much you have done. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we show it, we measure up. How come in the Africana there is no endowed chair? How come someone like Professor Turner he has dedicated mm -hmm. his entire life? He was a student, literally, mm -hmm. when he started. Mm -hmm. How come it has not been recognized? in meeting all the different missions of the university, teaching with excellence, mm -hmm. classes that uh, drew hundreds mm -hmm. for years. What is the recognition of that? Thank we you, publish mm -hmm. the mission of service to the community. So the point I'm making is we have to deal with this immediate situation, mm -hmm. but we need to look beyond. It's a How can issue. we look after the Africana? Mm -hmm. Not only in time of crisis, but as a commitment, consistent commitment to build it, to request that the university, in raising fund mm -hmm. to develop the university, mm -hmm. that Africana studies is not left out. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. If we can all give our uh, panelists a hand. <laughs> I'm so glad you were able to do this today. <laughs> Thank you.
also <laughs> remember, we ha you also have a Facebook page, Save the Africana Center. So if you're on Facebook, please visit that page. You'll get regular updates on what's going on. You can see all the letters and the petitions and the articles that have been written in the Cornell Daily Sun, the Ithaca Journal, Ithaca Times, all the papers that are there. So you can keep up with what's going on there. Also remember, uh, April 1st is coming up, and it's a very important date for several reasons. We have students, uh, uh, prospective students out there who are waiting to find out their acceptance status at many colleges and universities around the country, and many of you have applied to Cornell. So this is a particularly interesting topic for you and something of concern to you. So I'm sure you want to know what's going on and keep abreast of this as you're making your decisions as to where you're going to spend the next four years of your education. We also have alumni out there who have ballots that they need to submit for a trustee. And trustees are important people on that campus. They determine a lot of the policies, or at least have a, a helping hand in some of the policies that are created there. So when you're determining who you're going to vote for a trustee, keep these issues in mind and make sure that the person that you vote for is interested in these issues along with other issues that affect you as alumni. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. So with that, thank you to our panelists, thank you to our studio audience and our viewers at home. Again, this show is dedicated to our African scholars, our ancestors in love and struggle. Thank you for tuning in to Crisis in Black Higher Education. Again, my name is Anika Daniels Osaze. I'm your host, and I wish you a wonderful evening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>